I have been uh, working for the last several weeks on this theme, How to Vote Like a Christian. And I chose that title purposefully because I knew it was provocative. Um, there's a whole lot of ways to be unhappy about that phrase. And I don't know which one is yours, but I picked it so that you would pay attention. And here's what I've said so far about how to vote like a Christian. I've said, first of all, vote with a global, not a national perspective. We want to try to vote for policies and people that are for the good of all. I also said, vote with a deep concern for the environment. The environment is God's gift to us, and we are responsible for it. And I also said we are to vote to protect the little ones, and by little ones I meant all those who are without power in our world. And today, the toughest one, vote with integrity. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you would vote for me for president? No, 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 no. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to see the pifulous response that I'm going to get. What do you think are the chances that I could one day be elected president? Anybody think that could happen? Because I don't. Do you know why I can't get elected president? That is exactly what I was going for. Thank you, Monty. It is my tendency to say what I actually think, despite how you may choose to react to it. I have enough trouble just maintaining my position as pastor despite that, without trying to get elected president. It also, well, let's leave it right there. That's one reason why, that's about as good a reason as why I can't get elected as any. You know, in a world of sound bites, being a candid person is a problem. Because any time you speak, you can get something just snatched out of that and turned into what you didn't mean. If you make an hour-long speech, let's say you actually are a presidential candidate, let's assume I am, and I have just made an hour-long speech in which I have laid out my vision for the country and the world, but somewhere in the process I misspeak, misspeak and say um, uh, Don and Becky, for example, instead of Don and Bonnie. Of that whole speech, what's going to get put on the news? The one mistake that I made. So it is very difficult in our climate today to be a person of integrity in politics. Now let's take a look at what this is the Google definition of integrity. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, definition one. <laughs> definition two is the state of being whole and undivided. Now, when we look at candidates to vote for, one of the things we want in them, we ask for, we beg for, is integrity. But we are so often disappointed, and this year, it seems, there is almost nobody in America that thinks we have a political, a presidential candidate with integrity. Well, let me give you the bad news today. I know that I'm here to tell you the gospel, and the gospel is the good news, but here's the bad news to start off with. Dishonesty and lack of integrity are inevitable in our current political system. The fact is, our system makes it impossible to work with integrity. First of all is this reason. Nobody gets into politics, at least not on the upper level, that doesn't have a massive ego. You have got to be very confident in yourself and you have got to be sure of the your rightness of your opinions and you have got to have the ability to be rejected over and over again and still get up and move on. You have to have a massive ego to get anywhere in politics these days and I don't think it's ever been different from that. You have to have an ego to stand out in front and say, I'll lead, that takes a, kind, a level of, of uh, ego and self-assuredness that most of us don't have and some of us are annoyed by with others who do have it. If you step out in front like that, if you have that kind of an ego, then people are going to find that you are a difficult person at times to work with. It takes a lot because we're going to have to deal with people who have determined that they are somehow just a little bit better than the rest of us. People who have a too high opinion of themselves because if they didn't, they wouldn't do this work. And that's one reason you're going to be disappointed. The other is it's simply impossible to serve in our government and be a totally honest person. 
We have come up with a really good term for what politicians do. You know what we call it, don't you? Spin. And that's a really good example of what it is because, you know, the remote control that I'm using looks this way on one side, but if I spin it, it looks a little different on the other side, but it's the same thing. And we have learned how to phrase our words so that it is not entirely clear, perhaps, exactly what we meant. How do you feel about it when spin is happening? How do you like it? Are you okay with it or does it annoy you? I find it annoying. But it's inevitable, it can't be helped because politicians have to try to find a way to communicate, to speak to you in a way that you will support them and they have to do this. And when they do it, then we think they're lying. You know who this guy is? James G. Blaine, Speaker of the House from Maine ran for president in 1886. And while he was running, there was a campaign slogan against him. Do you know it? Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. If you think what's happening today is new, it isn't. This is the way it's always been. When every word is recorded and played back and analyzed, it is impossible to keep control over what it is that you say. And you have to do it all the time yourself. You have to compromise what you say from time to time in order to communicate and get where you're trying to go. Truth telling is not as simple as we would like it to be. Politics gets involved with some pretty complex issues. And if you try to give a complex answer to a complex issue, in today's world, what's going to happen? You're going to get sound bit. You're going to get a little piece of that taken out, and nobody's going to listen to your complicated answer. They're going to look for something simple, and it becomes as if you cannot speak honestly. This is just the way it is in our culture. So when the reporter says to you, do you support the bipartisan effort to limit the environmental impact of big box stores building on federal marshland in rural states whose businesses are funded by out-of-state corporations or by businesses with investments in the Cayman Islands within 72 miles of the development? Or are you against jobs for hardworking Americans? <laughs> That's what we're doing to our leaders and it makes it very difficult to find someone with integrity. I think most of the time our politicians do try to be straight with us. They're not out to hide some nefarious plot to overturn the country or turn it over to a foreign power. They're not involved in any of that. It's simply that trying to supply a complex answer to a complex problem in a world that wants everything simple is just going to be difficult. And another reason you don't find it integrity is that you have to compromise. That you can't tell from the picture, but that's Satan's hand. If you think of integrity, meaning you're going to hold a constant position and always be on that spot, then you are not able to work within politics. The U.S. Congress has been unable to get much done for the last several years because we have had people in there who are saying, this is the position I had when I got elected, this is the position I'm going to hold, and I will not compromise with you on that side. And when you have that, what happens? Nothing. And that's where we've been. So if you think of integrity as always being in the same place all the time, having the same positions, it's simply not true. You have to compromise. You know those hymns we sing in church on Sunday? Who picks those? I pick them. Why do I pick the ones I pick? Because I like them. Oh, I wish it were true. <laughs> There aren't enough hymns in the hymn book that I like to get me through a month of Sundays, much less a year, okay? I sing songs and I choose songs because I think they're going to be helpful to us in our worship. I pick them not because it suits me. If it were up to me, we would have a whole different thing going on. But it's not up to me. I am compromising with you. Are you compromising with me and with each other? So don't talk to me about integrity as the lack of compromise because that's what we do. It's how we get along with each other. Now, I'm going to skip ahead here. I'll right here. Let's say the state of being whole and undivided. Here's what I want to say about it. When we're talking about integrity, we are talking about having a position that you hold on to even though you may have to compromise. There has to be a basic level of integrity. What I'm looking for in candidates is I want to see 
a person whose life has been about service to others. That's one of the things that I think is most important to us. And the reason I think that is because I am a follower of the way of Jesus. And what did Jesus tell us to be? Servants. Masters? Stewards. Stewards. Servants. Those who care. Are we to wash the feet of one another or are we to expect someone else to do it? Yeah. Jesus calls us to service. And as a Christian, when I try to vote as a Christian, I look for people who have given their lives to the service of others. And many times we have candidates who have done that. And that's one of the things I look for. But you can't always find that. And the problem with integrity is simply this, that it's going to be up to us to have the integrity. Here's what I'm saying about that. If you feel that you're presented with a presidential choice of which neither candidate has integrity, how do you then vote with integrity? Well, you make the best choice you have, and then you determine that after the election is over, you are going to be a person who lives with integrity. It's not going to be up to necessarily who becomes president or who is in Congress. It's going to be you that has integrity. You are the one that's going to live up to it. And it isn't going to be easy. And that's why we are going to have to put the grit in integrity. It's going to take a lot of grit for us because no matter what happens in this election, the same thing is going to take place. There's going to be times when people who have power are going to stomp on people without. And our job is to do what we can to see that that doesn't happen. We are the ones that have to stand up and say, no, that is not okay. It is not okay to destroy the earth in order to make money. It is not okay to stomp on people who have no power. We can't be doing that either. We have to be people of integrity. We have to stand up and say, this is the way it is. And if integrity is holding a constant position, then we have to be the people that love one another. Jesus didn't only tell us to love one another. Who else did Jesus tell us to love? Ourselves. Ourselves? And who else did Jesus tell us to love? Our neighbors. Our neighbors. Boy, I'm going to have to take you back to Matthew chapter 5. Our what? Our enemies. Thank you, Karen. Jesus told us to love our enemies. And this nation because our contentious election process has gone on for so long and so rough, we've created a lot of enemies of each other, have we not? Do you have people in your own family that are ticked off at you right now because of your political choices? I have a brother who is a pastor who's probably preaching the opposite sermon of mine right now. And what are we going to do after the election, my brother and I? Are we going to turn our backs on each other? Or are we going to be a people of integrity? And are we going to love one another? Here's what you're going to do after the election, no matter who wins. No matter who wins as president, you, as a follower of Christ, are going to write a letter to that person, congratulating them on their win, letting them know that you'll be praying for them, that we can together create a just and fair world. You are going to pray for your enemies and love your enemies and support your enemies and you are going to be a person with integrity. Because maybe you can't get it out of your candidates, but we can at least find it within us, can we not? So, be here next week. We'll be here next week no matter who gets elected. No matter what else happens, we'll be here next week. And the reason we'll be here next week is because God has called us. And we are people with integrity. And we are going to love one another. We're just going to go ahead and love one another. And that's all there is to it. You can't stop us. Right? Are we going to love one another next week? Yes. No matter what happens. Yes. Are we going to love our neighbors next week? Yes. Oh, are we going to love our enemies next week? Yes. yes. Oh, that wasn't very encouraging. <laughs> Listen, I said, what do we have to put in integrity? Grit. The grit. So grit your teeth. Yes. And ask me, let me ask you again. Are we going to love our enemies? Yes. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to tell you. When my, da my brother's second daughter was born, um, the older daughter went over one time and kissed her on the nose and said, I love you so much. <laughs> Are you with me? 
Amen. You've been listening to a sermon by Rev. Stephen Carnahan, pastor of High Street Congregational Church in Auburn, Maine. If you feel inspired by what you hear, we invite you to join us in person for worship services every Sunday morning, beginning at 10 o'clock. Of course, you can always listen to Steve's sermons on the web. New sermons are posted every Monday by midday. Please take a moment to explore this website for more information about our church or visit our Facebook page at High Street Congregational Church, comma, UCC. We hope that God's presence will be known to you every hour of every day and that God's blessings will rest upon you now and always. See you next week.